For many reasons, including the fact that land was becoming more available, New York passed the Rural Cemetery Act in 1847. This allowed commercial burial grounds in rural parts of New York, not just upstate New York, but Brooklyn and Queens, which were still heavily rural. And this kept the dead from being buried in Manhattan, where decomposing bodies were blamed for cholera and yellow fever outbreaks. So whereas graveyards had been part of houses of worship or even on one's own property, the Rural Cemetery Act now made death a business, a business that began to boom in 1857 when Manhattan burials were outlawed below 86th Street. One reason was as New York's population soared, and by New York at this point, I mean Manhattan, the city had trouble finding adequate space to bury its dead. By 1822, cemeteries were getting, shall we say, smelly. One official had the graveyard at Trinity Church soaked with lime and wrote, the stench was so offensive as to cause several of my laborers to cascade freely. I'll let you figure out what cascade meant here. Now, here's a cartoon titled Board of Health. And look at those pesky Irish wanting to strike when they're causing the whole darn thing. I'm sorry, I can't help but get my Irish up here. Anyway, gentrification is not a new phenomenon to New York, and developers honed in on graveyards as financial opportunities, especially if these were graveyards where the poor were buried. City Hall Park, Washington Square Park, Madison Square Park, and Bryant Park all began life as potter's fields, which is another way of saying mass graves before they were transformed into parks. I guarantee you bodies are still there because there was no way to tell one from the other. And also, these were poor, largely immigrant dead people, so who cared? Meanwhile, established graveyards that had catered to people who could afford a burial and perhaps even a headstone were demolished and the bodies moved outside of Manhattan. It's estimated that 35,000 bodies were moved to Cypress Hill Cemetery in Queens. And today, it's estimated that 5 million people are buried in what's known as the Cemetery Belt meaning the dead in Queens now outnumber the living. This tour will focus on part of the cemetery belt, which is largely located on the Brooklyn Queens border, but also includes cemeteries like Cavalry in Woodside and Flushing Cemetery in Flushing. And I'm actually gonna start a little off the beaten path with Cavalry Cemetery. Much of what I've learned about Cavalry is brought to you by Mitch Waxman, because when you want to know about chemical waste, you want to know Mitch Waxman, the man who informed me that Newtown Creek has gonorrhea, and that may be the most horrific thing I tell you on this tour, but in addition to being a Newtown Creek expert, Mitch also knows a lot about cavalry and how chemical waste has affected it. This area is known as Old Cavalry or First Cavalry as it was the first section to be built. There are three others collectively known as New Cavalry. As an aside, one day I went to Cavalry just to take a look around, and mind you, Cavalry is miles long, yet I immediately spotted the headstone of my great-grandparents. I didn't even know they were buried there, and I've never been that lucky since. Cavalry has the largest number of burials of any cemetery in the United States. Three million Catholics are here, and one Protestant family, the Alsops, who fenced off their family supposedly once their land was sold to the Catholic Church. But what I wanted to focus on is the melted faces of cavalry. You can see the industry here, and it was even worse years ago. As Mitch wrote on his site, Newtown Pentacle, quote, Cavalry Cemetery, dripping in century glory, sits incongruously in an industrial moonscape stained with a queer and iridescent color. Its marble obelisks and acid rain etched markers landmark it as an acropolis of some forgotten civilization." End quote. The nitrates and sulfites and even today's BQE disfigure the statues here into what looks like some kind of grotesque monument to smallpox. On a completely different note, First Cavalry has members of organized crime buried here, mainly from the early 20th century. But it was also where they filmed the Don's funeral in The Godfather. No, Michael, it's not Clemenza. Keep looking. There's that lousy Barzini. Who's he with? Yeah, it's Tessio.
If I spoil this for you, I'm sorry, but if you haven't seen The Godfather by now, I don't know what to tell you. Joe Spinelli, by the way, who played Corleone soldier Willie Chichi, is buried in cavalry. He died in 1989, age 52, from hemophilia. Now we're going to make our way to the actual belt. This is Macpela Cemetery. It's known for two things, Harry Houdini and neglect. I'm here to report that both are in better shape. Houdini has had his head returned. It was actually rebuilt with stronger material in 2011. And the grounds overall, which had been in terrible shape, have been greatly cleaned up. Though it's a pretty odd place, I have to say. As soon as my husband and I arrived, so did someone who I think is the cemetery administrator who was demanding his workers find him string. This went on for quite some time, and I'm not sure why string, but I basically just filmed Houdini's grave and moved on. So what does Macpela mean? Well, among other things, it means two caves. According to Genesis, Abraham bought his Machpelah from Ephron the Hittite in order to have a burial place for himself and his family. And for those of you who don't know, Jewish cemeteries, and I believe it's all of them, though I'm not sure, do not allow the human form to be represented at all. That's why you don't see any giant Moseses or Abrahams or even a hand. But Houdini escaped from the rules, so to speak, at Machpelah. Born Eric Weiss in Hungary, you can see not only is Houdini's head here, but there also appears to be a weeping angel, which would seem to be breaking all sorts of rules, but that's Macpela. One rule they stuck to, though, is that Houdini is not buried with his wife, Bess, who is a Catholic and is buried at the Catholic Gate of Heaven Cemetery in Westchester. But Houdini is here with his mother, Cecilia, brother, Theodore, and brother, Leopold, and sister, Gladys, though their monuments have disappeared. You can also see the medallion here. The grave is now cared for by the Houdini Museum in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Why Scranton? I don't know. Moving on. When you think Cemetery Belt, chances are you're thinking Cypress Hills. And this is quite the entrance here. Cypress Hills was the first non-denominational cemetery organized in Brooklyn and Queens, as it's part of both. And its 225 acres are bisected by the Jackie Robinson Parkway, which is ironic because here's Jackie Robinson. He's buried with his mother-in-law, his son, and two close friends. His wife, Rachel, turned 99 in July and has outlived her husband by almost 50 years. There are offerings left. You'll see them at the graves of many celebrities and sports figures who I guess are celebrities. The offerings tend to represent the people buried here. I like the baseball that says thank you, and I didn't want to touch anything, but I was able to zoom in on this photo. I don't know who he is, except that he was a catcher. Now, Babe Ruth, by comparison, who, like Houdini's wife, is also buried at Gate of Heaven, has a less humble approach. In addition to Baby Babe walking with Jesus, it smells like dive bar here, though it's the only place I know of where Yankee and Sox fans can gather peacefully. It is fitting. Here's me holding a Budweiser for a video I did on this grave. Billy Martin paid extra to be buried right by here. Death is big business. Jackie Robinson was only 53 when he died. It would seem like the unbelievable stresses put on him over the years and diabetes had made him nearly blind, as well as the untimely death of his son from a car accident were too much for even a superhero. Across from Jackie is the burial spot for the newer wave of immigrants to New York. And it appears someone just left a cup of coffee. Coming up are two other celebrities buried by Jackie Robinson and they form an interesting trio. Jackie Robinson, Mae West, and Piet Mondrian. Mae West and her family are in a crypt inside this building that was locked when we were there. During a previous visit, I was able to get this photo, though. That day was about three years ago, and a worker told me a man comes every Friday in a limousine and goes inside to leave her flowers. When I asked the security guard recently if he knew about this man, he said no, but I wouldn't be surprised. A lot of crazy things go on around here. I was surprised when I went to Greenwood Cemetery and saw the rather staid headstone for Lewis Comfort Tiffany. Perhaps he was sick of stained glass. 
The same might be true for the final resting place of Dutch abstract painter Piet Mondrian. Here's an example of what he's known for. And here's his marker. I'm happy someone was inspired to do some Mondrian artwork here. Now, I thought the Collier brothers would be our last graveyard visit to Cypress Hills. They were brothers who brought the idea of hoarding into the public consciousness. The older one was named Homer and was born in 1881, and the younger Langley was born in 1885, and they live with their parents in a brownstone at 128th Street and 5th Avenue. Their father died in 1923, then their mother in 1929, leaving them alone with all of their possessions. In 1947, an anonymous caller alerted the police that there was a dead body in the Collier's home. After the responding officer was unable to get in, an emergency squad of multiple men began pulling out all the junk that was blocking their way. The foyer had a wall of old newspapers, folding beds and chairs, half a sewing machine, boxes, parts of a wine press, and just lots of junk. After five hours of digging, Homer Collier's body was found surrounded by newspapers piled to the ceiling. The medical examiner said that Homer had been dead for less than a day and had died from starvation. A couple weeks later, a workman found the body of Langley Collier 10 feet from where Homer had died. Langley was found in a two-foot-wide tunnel lined with rusty bed springs and a chest of drawers. The medical examiner determined that Langley had died about a month earlier. Police theorized that Langley inadvertently tripped a booby trap he had created and was crushed by debris. His death was caused by asphyxiation. So I'd said I thought this was our last gravesite visit in Cypress Hills because I wanted to see where the Union and Confederate soldiers are buried next to each other, which I had assumed was next door in Cypress Hills National Cemetery. National cemeteries are burial grounds for veterans and their families, and this is the only one in the five boroughs. It has more than 21,000 interments. In 1862, due to the Civil War, space was made for veterans who died in action. It was known as the Union Grounds. Eight years after the first burial, an inspection report noted that 3,170 Union soldiers and 461 Confederate POWs were buried here. However, Union Grounds is back in regular Cypress Hills. The Cypress Hills National Cemetery wasn't bought until 1884. So a U-turn it was, and here we see Union and Confederate together. Sometimes I wonder if the people buried know who they're buried next to, like in our town, and if they get along. One way you can tell Union from Confederate without even reading it is that the Union markers are rounded on top and the Confederate come to a point. Heading into Flushing, I'd been wanting to go to the old town of Flushing Burial Ground, but it was closed. There's a great story behind it, and if you Google Old Town and Flushing Burial Ground and Forgotten New York, you'll learn about it. But across the street is Flushing Cemetery, and I wanted to show you Louis Armstrong, a.k.a. Satchmo, the great trumpet player who became a Queens resident thanks to his wife, Lucille, who wanted to put down roots while her husband kept touring. The Louis Armstrong House Museum is about five miles west of the cemetery in Corona. According to this article in 2020's New York Times, the stove was custom made for them and the cabinets were lacquered in the same color as Lucille's Cadillac. I had no idea why there were a bunch of Jolly Rogers on here, and I looked it up, and apparently at one point Louis Armstrong re-released a compilation of his older material with a bootleg record company called Jolly Roger Records. Now, just for the heck of it, I looked at who was buried next to Louis Armstrong, and it was someone named George Lamb. Uh, and I thought, well, why don't I look him up and see what his story is?
Well, what a story. He worked for the Queens District Attorney Bureau, and if you'll pay no attention to the fact that the Times misspelled the word detective, I will read to you from his 1964 obituary. Mr. Lamb, during his 41 years with the Bureau, had become well-known as the Dean of America's Husband Chasers and the man who brought back 3,000 fathers. His job was to trace men who had abandoned their wives and children and to see that they provided for their dependents. In 1944, Mr. Lamb left the city for the West Coast, armed with indictments against 26 fathers who had failed to provide for their children. He had little information to use in finding most of them. Ten weeks later, he was back with more than $6,500 he had collected from the delinquent spouses. His report showed that he had found 22 of the 26. This was a typical result in the career of Mr. Lamb, who dealt with cases from every walk of life. He tracked them down by studying their habits, tastes, and idiosyncrasies, which he knew were much harder for a man to change than a mere name. Adjusted for inflation, this is how much George Lamb brought back with him, without the benefit of Google. Like Cypress Hills, Flushing Cemetery represents a lot of the newer wave of immigrants who have come to New York in the last hundred or so years. This section here is heavily Asian and Greek. And because a lot of the people here have passed away pretty recently, you will see that they have gotten a lot of visitors as opposed to the older sections where the people who have passed away, their descendants have now passed away and so on. And uh, there's a lot of vibrancy here, um, particularly in the decoration. Um, I am heartened by it. Uh, I, it. It's not something I would do, but um, this isn't my family. So uh, in, in a way, it's a celebration of who the person was. Um, and uh, you'll see a lot of that uh, in the newer section. And I looked up Cargong on Find a Grave, and it says Chinese immigrant entrepreneur who started a laundry business, raised a family of five children and sent them all to college, bought real estate, rented apartments, and invested in the stock market to pursue the American dream and contributed generously to charities and school in his hometown in China and America. And this man passed away 20 years ago and they are still celebrating him like this. So we salute you. This grave celebrates a mixed marriage this one has multiple religions side by side. And this one, my husband noted, has the Trigon and Perisphere from the 1939 World's Fair. Now, I'm just going to pause here for a second. And if you take a look at this headstone, uh, you'll notice that David seems to be rather young for someone who is interested in the 1939 World's Fair. And so I did a little digging again, and I found this. Among other things, he was president of the Flushing Meadows Corona Park World's Fair Association. And he was a part of the reason why we now have a Queen's Museum of Art. I will read a bit from his obituary dated 2008. As a child, Mr. Oates found refuge from the Flushing Housing Project where he lived by going to the park. But one day in 1962, he found that the park had been fenced off for World's Fair construction. After sneaking through a hole in the fence, he was grabbed by a guard. Mr. Moses, meaning Robert Moses, happened to spot what was happening, called the 12-year-old boy over, and liked what he said about the park. For years, Mr. Moses was something of a mentor to Mr. Oates. And that is a side of Mr. Moses that uh, you don't normally hear about. Also, I learned that uh, Robert Moses once wrote poetry. Now we're gonna to travel to some smaller cemeteries. This one is in Bayside, which I haven't spent much time in, but given the houses, I'd like to. We're at the Lawrence Cemetery, 
Because of the iron fence, I thought I'd just have to do some dramatic filming here, but apparently some amazingly strong person, or perhaps a car, bent a spot. So you get dramatic fence filming and a look inside. The Lawrence family were early European settlers who were deeded the land in 1645. It wasn't originally meant to be a graveyard, it was where they would picnic. So the first burial wasn't actually until 1832. The last burial was in 1939, and for years after, it was basically used as a garbage dump. Uh, now it's been cleaned up and it's run by the Bayside Historical Society, and it's a city landmark. This is just one of the burial grounds that belong to the Lawrence family. One no longer exists, and one is in Astoria. And I could spend hours chronicling those buried here, but for now, I'll show you a few highlights. This obelisk belongs to Cornelius Van Wyck Lawrence, mayor of New York City from 1834 to 1837. Here's Effingham Lawrence, who served one day in the House of Representatives. His daughter, Hannah Townsend Lawrence, wife Anne Townsend Lawrence, and their daughter, Mary Nichols Lawrence, wife of New York City Mayor Andrew H. Mickle. And this poor soul, Augusta Pratt, lost her cross. I thought after a while I was done filming the headstones here until I saw one off in the distance. This is Lawrence Moccasin, servant to Effingham Lawrence. This reminded me of when I went to the Asbury Methodist Cemetery on Staten Island and saw this grave site. Whom was he faithful to? Ichabod Crane. He was a real person. I think Juan may have died during a yellow fever epidemic, but I'm not sure. The only information I have on him is that he's in this 1855 census listed as a servant named Joseph with no last name. Taking our treacherous leave of the grounds, we arrive at Douglaston Zion Cemetery with a much easier ingress. I had just started looking at headstones when I came under attack by these dogs. It turns out they were harmless, though it reminded me of my most terrifying moment in a cemetery. I've never seen a ghost, I don't think, but I thought this dog was going to go for my throat or I was going to be possessed by the devil. Cemetery dogs are no joke. This was in Calvary. Now, I wanted to show you these headstones. You may have seen them before. They're a bluish gray and most date to the 19th century, early 20th century. They're known as white bronze markers, though they're neither white nor bronze, they're zinc. Knock and hope that no one knocks back. You can hear the metal. This is one of the smallest ones I've ever seen. Usually they look like this one though, upright. And this also shows one of the downsides of zinc. Uh, they're hollow and the weight of the statue can cause the lower part of the monument to buckle and then tilt. Zinc grave markers were first made in 1873 by the Monumental Bronze Company in Bridgeport, Connecticut. These metal markers were made to order to the customer's specifications and were relatively inexpensive compared to marble and granite, which had to be carved. The Monumental Bronze Company stopped making zinc grave markers in 1914 when they pivoted, as we would say today, and began making ammunition for World War I. Now, the rain and this marker let me know that it was time to leave, and so I headed over to the Waters family burial ground. The story of the cemetery is all too common and also ties back to the Douglaston Zion Cemetery. Now, the Waters Cemetery had belonged to the Waters family, descendants of the Mattencock, Shinnecock, and Montauk tribes. In the 1920s, the city wanted a wide and northern boulevard, which doomed the Native Americans buried here. James Waters, also known as Chief Wild Pigeon, fought the grave's obliteration and managed to delay it for years, but the fight ended after Waters himself died, age 51, in 1927. He was buried at Zion Episcopal Cemetery, where we just were. I was not able to get this marker because of the rain, but here is a photo. It's a split boulder with a tree growing through in the inscription, Here Rests the Last of the Mattencock. The Queen's Topographical Bureau had surveyed the area in 1919 and identified 13 graves at the site. 
During the expansion of Northern Boulevard, the city moved 30 bodies to Douglaston Cemetery, though it's estimated that more than 300 people are buried here. This is what the site looks like now. And this is the back of the buildings and the area on Jesse Court and beyond where I think a lot more bodies are buried. Our last stop is Elmhurst Cemetery, which was discovered, or should I say rediscovered, in 2011 when construction workers found a body that was so well-preserved they thought they'd found a murder victim. Her remains were so well-preserved, in fact, that archaeologist Scott Warnosh found smallpox lesions on her bones, so what had been a murder scene turned into a biohazard scene, with the CDC rushing in to see if there was a new case of smallpox in New York City. As it turns out, these were the mummified remains of a woman who had died around 1850 and been buried in an iron coffin, which had been split by a backhoe in 2011. Iron coffins were known as fist coffins and were only produced for a brief time during the mid-19th century, so the casket, along with the style of the woman's clothes, helped to date her body. Fisk coffins were named after their designer, Amon Dunbar Fisk, and were styled after Egyptian sarcophagi and also featured a small glass window over the face for viewing. Document research revealed that the woman's name was Martha Peterson and she died of smallpox when she was about 26 years old. The 1850 federal census showed that right before Martha died, she lived in Elmhurst, then known as Newtown, probably as a servant of William Raymond, who was the brother-in-law, neighbor, and business partner of iron coffin maker Amon Dunbar Fisk. Martha was regarded highly enough that she was buried in one of these coffins. Martha was buried in the original location of the St. Mark's AME Church, founded by the United African Society of Long Island in 1828. The church has moved multiple times and is now in Corona, but up until the discovery of the lady in the iron coffin, few members were aware that there had even existed an Elmhurst location at all, much less a burial ground. Fifteen other bodies have been found at that site, though none in iron coffins. It's unknown how many people are buried here, however, as the city did not allow the church to move the bodies when they moved from Elmhurst. Despite the publicity, it appears as though this site is going to be sold to build a 55-foot-tall residential building as it, it seems as though the grounds will not be landmarked. But construction can only start when there has been an agreement struck between landowner Sung Lu and the St. Mark's AME Church of Corona. This is what it looks like today. Continuing in the story is another cemetery that is still a burying ground, even though it doesn't have headstones. This is one in Staten Island.